Okay. Today, I want to switch gears a bit since we're all uh, experts in fracture and uh, talk about friction. You know, the, now, we all know friction. We all learned friction, you know, back in kindergarten, friction coefficients, and whatever. Uh, by the way, I'm trying to speak in a low tone so you can all fall asleep after a good meal. I know that I would like to. And the ground rules are the same. So if you want to wake me up or wake up your neighbors, just ask a question, any question. Uh, so if nothing is something is not clear to you, if nothing is clear to you, just ask. And I promise that it will still be unclear, but at least I'll try to answer. Um, okay, so I'll try to convince you that friction is fracture. And uh, not exactly this kind. You know, we'll try to actually, the friction that I'll be talking about is the very boring block on block friction. Um, you take some normal force, you push down, you push uh, with the shear force, and here it comes. Okay, wait. I didn't want to put too much excitement after lunch, but I, I have no choice. Watch it. Okay, that's what we'll be talking about. In fact, even too much. So why is this even interesting? Coulomb solved it hundreds of years ago. Actually, he plagiarized Amoton, which is why it's called the Amoton Coulomb. No? But uh, what we'll be concentrating on is what happens along this interface it's actually holding two blocks together. Now, personally, I never understood the friction coefficient. I love the friction coefficient because it's one of the few problems in physics that I can actually solve. You know, a block down an inclined plane, you know, how much do you have to tilt it? It's wonderful. But I really didn't understand how a single number could... Uh, to talk about, you know, could, could characterize what's going on here. And then I made a Gedanken experiment. I can say that here because there are a lot of string th theorists around. So they're the only ones that understand this German term for thought experiment. But, um, and I thought, okay, let's make this interface larger and larger. How the hell can this point and this point know to, to let go at the same time, it can't. So there has to be something happening that's non-trivial along this interface to kind of tell everybody that, okay, guys, it's time to move. Now, there could be a number of things that, uh, that could happen, but uh, what I'll try to show you is that it's actually the identical to the fracture that we've been talking about over the past few days. Okay, and ah, and we discovered that. So my intuition was right. We did an experiment uh, with my then student, uh, Shmuel Rubinstein, who looked at a point here and a point here with the laser. And by God, we saw that they didn't move at the same time. Ah, OK, we got it. And then we went and we published our first paper about this stuff. And then we realized that, OK, that's stupid because you make these blocks large enough, you're talking about two tectonic plates that are rubbing together. So what we are describing is an earthquake. Good. But people have been studying earthquakes for a long, long time. So what can we possibly say? So basically, I had the feeling be just of sheer ignorance that we were rediscovering the wheel. Okay, so we've made our own terminology, but it's, it's exactly the same thing. So I started to learn a little, about, a little bit about earthquake physics just to be able to uh, give an excuse that I really didn't know, but it's okay or something. And then I realized that the earthquake people don't know anything more than I do. Well, they do. They have a lot of statistics and they have a lot, but there's very, very little hard data about earthquakes. And why is that? because uh, even the most shallow earthquake takes place maybe 15 kilometers below the, the Earth's surface. 
And most of our probes are, okay, seismic probes, for example, which is equivalent to, you know, someone putting the ear on the ground and listening and somebody else and then trying to triangulate what you hear. So the details of what happens and what drives earthquakes are very, are, are, are largely unknown or in many respects, there are many, many models. There's a lot of work, but again, no one actually sees a real earthquake. You see the effects of the earthquake if your house falls down, okay. But that's just the vibrations that are that are set off when something moves along. So, um, so we just we we found out that we're actually doing something new by accident, uh, and um, looking quantitatively at uh, at earthquake dynamics. So it depends who I talk to, how I cast this stuff. You know, either people that like to rub blocks together, or people that like to rub tectonic plates together. But it's basically the same thing, and that's and I'll show you that in a second. Okay, um, let's go back to the classics. So this is uh, first uh, probably the Egyptians and the Greeks did it first, but the first reference that I know of to uh, the friction coefficient is Da Vinci, um, and basically he came up with the idea that the sheer force that one has to, uh, to apply to get something to slide is proportional to the, uh, the normal force. And this was his experimental apparatus, very similar to mine, but uh, I don't mind copying uh, uh, the, the works of geniuses. Okay, and then came Amoton and Coulomb. And the Coulomb-Amoton law, their, their main contribution was that uh, they put in two friction coefficients, not one constant of proportionality, but two. And the idea was that there's a static friction coefficient uh, that starts the onset of motion and the dynamic friction coefficient that governs the uh, continuous motion. It's interesting, though, that you see Amoton died before Coulomb was born. So you wonder how they, they were together on the same paper or something. And... Uh, that's a story in itself, but uh, no one believed this, but everybody believed this guy. So when he discovered the paper, he kind of resubmitted it. Okay. What's the physics behind this funny law? Well, it took 500 years. But two Englishmen, uh, Bowden and Tabor, came up with the first uh, kind of uh, scientific explanation for what's going on. So they said, okay, any two blocks, no matter how smooth actually on the interface are gonna be rough. So the real area of contact, this is the real honest to God area of contact. I come from Jerusalem, we have a monopoly on God, you might read in the news, but um, it's very, very small. We'll call the real contact, area of contact A for lack of imagination. And it's orders of magnitude smaller than the nominal contact area. Okay, what does that mean? Once I apply any normal force, each one of these contacts is under huge pressure and it's actually going to yield and flow until when? Until the contact area is such that the, the, that the stress on, on each one of these junctions is more or less at the yield stress of the material. That's what a yield stress is when a solid stops flowing and becomes kind of like a solid. So this is actually an interesting system because everything here is exactly at a threshold value. It, it's it's uh, under huge, huge pressures, much larger than anything that one could exert on these blocks themselves. But that's an aside. Okay. So the idea is that then the real area of contact will grow until the local pressure is such that it's uh, the pressure is equal to the yield strength of the material. So that gives us this uh, that the, the normal force is proportional with the yield stress to the real area of contact. Okay, but we want this thing to slide. We want to make an earthquake or something. So we start to push. Well, how hard do we have to push? Well, with this picture, it's very easy because the force that we apply, we're assuming, of course, that all of these contacts will give up instantaneously, is that uh, we have to apply a, sure, a force that's equal to the shear strength times the area 
again of all the contexts. So the area per unit, unit or the strength per unit area of each one of these contexts. So again, we have that the, uh, the shear force is proportional to the real area of contact. And then if we look at the, the ratio between this and that, we, we derive the friction law. And this is really great. You know, I, I, it's a wonderful explanation. Um, it even makes sense. And I agree with everything except that uh, this business of the instantaneous fracture, because we know about fracture, nothing instantaneous happens at all. We have cracks. Cracks will, will break one, one point after another, but all of these points will not self-destruct at the same time. So everything here is correct, but the onset of friction is, is the result of fracture of the discrete contacts that form the interface. And that fracture process is basically an earthquake. And we know about fracture because, um, okay, and, and this is mode two fracture for those who heard me a few days ago, and this is mode of one fracture that we know and love. But in each case, if we have any crack at all, a crack will uh, focus uh, the stresses at, at its tip, so preferentially break uh, the, all the contacts ahead of it. So this is a totally different process than, again, all of the contacts giving up at the same time. So the material is preferentially, or the, the interface is preferentially ruptured at the tip of this crack, or crack, I'll call it a crack-like object right now. Soon it will become a real crack, but I don't want to go ahead of myself. And uh, so if the frictional failure is orders of magnitude below the, the theoretical strength of breaking all these contacts at the same time. Okay, now the first thing I want to show you like probably the second thing that I want to show you is that all of these earthquakes are precisely described by fracture mechanics. This is the kind of stuff that we talked about uh, actually in the first lecture. These are simple cracks. No instabilities, no bifurcations, no oscillations, just boring cracks. They're not so boring, I guess, if your house happens to be sitting on a fault and an earthquake hits, but that's a different story. Okay, so, uh, and as I mentioned, this is just a picture of the San Andreas Fault in California. Um, but we discovered that this, this problem, again, is, is, is equivalent to, in, uh, in many senses, to uh, the dynamics of earthquakes. And now we've seen and different modes of earthquakes have been either predicted or observed or even deduced or something. But again, there's no real data. But what I'll show you is that uh, we find uh, many things that are exactly um, analogous to what people uh, surmise along the sur uh, under the surface of the earth. And we've actually actually even come up with some some things that people hadn't surmised until now. But I'm getting slow, slightly ahead of myself. Um, okay, yeah. That's just the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> this is just an aerial photo, or satellite photograph or something. Okay, okay. But uh, yeah. It is also uh, shear is happening in ocean and uh, land. Yeah, but the ocean is uh, here, maybe five hundred meters uh, thick. The crust is uh, is forty kilometers thick, and the earthquake ha happens at fifteen kilometers. So we can forget about. Uh, I mean, the details always matter, but for, for this picture, they they don't. Never realized that the Pacific was black. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, okay, now before I tell you about it, some of our results, I'll show you how we get them. Okay, so we said that uh, the character, or the star of our show, one of the stars of our show is the real area of contact. But how do you measure the real area of contact? That's a tough one. Well, it turns out that it's not so tough if you get lucky and figure it out. Okay, so here's what we do. Our uh, two tectonic plates are made of transparent materials, in this case, plexiglass. 
Uh, these are the dimensions. This is about 200 millimeters long, about 100 millimeters uh, high, and about six millimeters wide. It's uh, tall and thin or something. We wanted, this is the longest interface uh, that we could squeeze into the laboratory with what we need to, uh, to actually measure the real area of contact. Now, how do we actually, how do we do that? Well, we're gonna illuminate this, the entire interface with light. So we're gonna shine light and, and light up this whole interface, but we're gonna do it where the angle of incidence of the light, it should be a laser sheet, ah, here we go. So this is a sheet of light and it illuminates the whole interface. And this incident angle is well beyond the angle for total re internal reflection between this, uh, this, this transparent material and the air that's trapped in the rough interface. What does that mean? Light hits an air pocket and it's immediately reflected out of the interface. And when is light transmitted through the interface? Only at the contacts. So if we take a fast camera here, and here the cameras we're using is taking a picture of the entire interface around 600,000 frames a second. So once every one and a half microseconds, we take a picture of, of the real area of contact and it's seeing only the contacts themselves. So this is a nice way to follow the dynamics of how these contacts actually break. Now, this is a, a raw image of what we see or just a piece of it. I think it's about a, a centimeter uh, in the center here or something. And uh, this is actually taken when an earthquake is moving through, as you can see. Oh, well, you can't see that, huh? I can't see it either. But if we normalize this by the real area of contact right before anything happens, then what one finds is something like this. So here, the blue color is less contact area. The red color is the initial contact area. And this yellow line here is the front that's sweeping across. That's our earthquake. And there's the front position. And uh, this is just a picture or a bunch of frames of an earthquake or a, or a frictional crack moving along this interface at nearly a thousand meters a second. Here we haven't bothered to cheat nature by making the, the uh, sound speeds three orders of magnitude lower or something. Um, why we didn't, different question, but uh, we didn't. So this, this makes things more difficult to see, but as you can see, we can see them fairly well. Now, we're gonna supplement these uh, real area of contact measurements with measurements of the strain. So the strain is a tensor. So we're gonna put little uh, rosette strain gauges, which measure each element of the 2D uh, strain tensor um, as close to the interface as we can put them a few millimeters away. We can't put them on the interface because then the glue that we use to put these strain gauges on would pollute the interface and we'd have to chuck this very expensive piece of plastic out. So this is what we do. And each component, of these uh, 20 or so strain gauges that we have along the interface, we measure that uh, at uh, now over one, a million times a second. So we get very rapid measurements of all of the strain components uh, at, at about 20 positions along the interface. And, we, and then we can compare that to the movie that we're going to see or to the, to the data we get for the rapidly moving fronts. Um, this is a typical experiment. So this is thick slip friction. Okay. This is the shear force that we're applying. Up, up, up it goes and then boom. Okay, it slips. It starts again, slips and so on and so forth. So this is nothing that's, that you don't know from... Uh, okay. An example of this is that. Okay. The noise the chalk makes is stick slip friction. So you all know about stick slip friction. That's what, it is. so there's nothing fancy here. Um, now we're gonna focus on the fast processes that happen just at the onset where we go from static to dynamic friction as it were. Okay, so these are two stick slip events here. These are, this is the real area of contact as a function of time where I've integrated 
over the, uh, the thin component. So if you like, this is a poor person's movie. Uh, time and space uh, are shown here. Each line here is the real area of contact at each individual time. Now the time here is about seven seconds. So we're gonna zoom in on one specific event and then we get uh, these fronts, these rapidly moving fronts that we saw. And then as I mentioned, we're gonna integrate over this dimension and show movies such as this. So this is an earthquake in the laboratory. It started from one edge of the system and to confuse you, time is on the vertical axis, axis, and the space is on the horizontal axis. So the higher the slope, the slower it's going. Okay, so we have something that starts very slowly, and then it gets faster and faster and faster. CR is the Raleigh wave speed, the same thing that we learned about a few days ago. Just to remind you that disturbance moving along a free surface. And it gets very near the Raleigh wave speed by the time it finishes its, its journey across the uh, sample. And actual frictional motion only takes place, global frictional motion, when this earthquake traverses the entire interface. And only when the last contact is broken, we see any macroscopic motion in the material. Okay, um, so we find that the onset of friction is basically governed by these propagating crack-like fronts. Now, are they, are they cracks? Um, let's take a look. Ah, one thing that it's worth mentioning is that, uh, remember that I told you that my group does perfect experiments, but even perfect experiments can result in imperfect uh, results. Well, actually, the results are perfect, but, but very but totally unexpected. Okay, so let's just take a look at the stress profile, in this case, the normal stress, uh, the, the, stre the pressure along the uh, interface. Uh, as we take a perfectly homogeneous normal force, ah, and these blocks that we made, that, that, that I'm talking about, aren't the kind of blocks that you, you, know, you buy uh, from uh, from your uh, store and then just sand down or something like that. In order to create a very good interface here, these are diamond machined to uh, to optical flatness, and then they're roughened by uh, scientific sandpaper. Why is that? Because if if this uh, interface was like rough, even on a micron scale or wavy on a micron scale, we'd only have one or two points of contact. And I want, I want an ensemble of contact points. And that's why we went to some effort to make these two mate perfectly. Okay, anyway, I'm starting to push down and this is the normal force and take a look at what happens. Maybe take a look, oh, here we go. So as we go, uh, the normal force starts to be fairly uh, constant and then it starts to become kind of Ah, okay. So it's it's kind of flat, but the shear stress at the same time, it kind of becomes uh, strange. Okay, it's not it's not what you would expect. It's not, and and actually we're not even pushing this. Uh, there's no external force being applied to the system. What's going on here? You can tell by this cartoon. The ends of this thing are pinned by friction. Okay, it's not letting the edges slip. We're pushing down on this plate and we're squashing it. So we're creating a, actually asymmetric shear forces along this interface, very large ones, before we even do anything. And now when we apply an external shear force, then it gets worse. So by the time something actually slips, we're looking at, at a very, very inhomogeneous stress distribution both in, in normal and shear. Okay, so before I go on and talk about uh, to characterize the earthquakes that we see, um, basically we see all kinds of earthquakes in the system. And a lot of it is because of this initial sh uh, stress concentration or pr stress profile that we develop. And we can play games by tilting slightly the blocks and all that to, to, to modify it. 
But we see, for example, very slow earthquakes moving at about a hundredth of the Raleigh wave speed or the shear wave speed here. We see um, cracks like we talked about earlier in the week, which accelerate and actually very, get very close to the, the shear wave speed or the Raleigh wave speed of the material. We'll call those sub Raleigh because they're below the Raleigh wave speed. And we even see supersonic or super shear ruptures that are, that are earthquakes that are going faster than uh, the shear wave speed, slower than the dilatational wave speed, but faster than the shear wave speed. And the reason it looks like there's steps here is because we don't have the res they're going so fast that we don't have the resolution to see them. So we, we, it's a continuous motion, but we don't see that with our optics. So I'll be talking today about the, these types. I'll, I'll neglect the super shear ruptures, although we see them often and we know quite a lot about them now. By the way, all of these types of earthquakes are seen in nature as well. In fact, the super shear earthquakes are the most destructive of them all. Um, the last, the latest earthquake in Turkey, for example, that resulted in a lot of uh, loss of lives was a super shear earthquake. Uh, why are they more destructive? Because uh, the damage of earthquakes is by shaking the ground. Now, if you get hit by a Mach cone instead of gradually uh, increased shaking, then the damage is much, much more. And that's what happens with these earthquakes. But I won't talk about them. I don't, I don't think uh, for the rest of this talk, it's a whole nother talk entirely. Okay, so what will I be talking about? So the first thing I want to show you is that friction really is fractured. It doesn't just look like a crack, it is a crack, and I'll prove it to you in a second. And then we're going to uh, put some oil on the, uh, we're gonna lubricate the interface. Okay, friction, lubricated friction, brings down the friction coefficient, forget all this fracture business. Well, we'll show you that friction is still fracture even when lubricated, and there's even a surprise there. And then we're going to use fracture mechanics. Once we've established that this is fracture, we're going to use it to predict things. So for example, I'm going to predict the magnitude of an earthquake in the laboratory. Predict means I'll tell you the magnitude before it happens, not after it happens. Post-dict is, is actually easier sometimes. Um, and then I'll show you that we fully understand and can predict the dynamics of an earthquake, at least in the laboratory, and what you need to know in order to do that. And then we'll come back to, if I have time at least, the last thing I'd like to talk about is this thing actually explains the threshold for friction because uh, all of these are running cracks or arrested cracks. We want to know how this frictional crack starts, and that's, that's a nucleation problem. So it's basically the problem of, remember I had that piece of paper with little tear and I, I needed the tear, I needed to establish a crack before I can talk about the cracks dynamics. But how do you do that? How does nature do that in, in a rough interface? So I'll be talking about that as well. Okay, so the star of our show besides the real area of contact is mode two fracture because we're applying shear. And now, in all of these modes of fracture, tensile fracture mode two and tearing fracture mode three, um, the surfaces behind the propagating crack are considered to be stress-free. I'll remind you, how do we solve this problem to begin with? Well, we have the equations for two uncoupled waves, shear and longitudinal in the bulk, and we couple them on the boundaries. So behind the crack tip are stress-free conditions. There's no stress there because the crack has relieved all the stress. And in front of the crack, we have uh, zero displacement conditions. Nothing's moved yet. And when we solve just the wave equation, coupling them to this boundary problem, then we get the square root of R and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it's easy to say it's harder to do, but I'm not going to do it. Just remember. Okay. But Anyway, fracture talks about a stress-free boundary. And in the friction problem, we always have contact. We're breaking partial contacts, but there's always, 
we're pushing these things together with with forces of uh, I don't know about a ton or something. So something has to hold up, has to uh, negate those forces. So we have. So how can you, I even talk about a fracture problem for friction? And the answer to that, well, okay, this is the short review of fracture mechanics, but okay, uh, you don't need it because you're all experts. One thing I haven't told you is that among the experts, shear fracture doesn't exist. So if I take a bulk um, material and I apply in shear, what the crack will do is rotate so as to be in tension at its tip. That's what the experts say. So um, personally, I'm not an expert, so I don't say that, but um, that's, that's textbook. Textbooks are wrong in this case, but whatever. Okay, now when can shear fracture occur? It can only occur along a weak interface, where we've, which is exactly what friction is. We have uh, a much weaker interface than the bulk of the material. So that interface constrains a crack to move along it. So actually this is the only mode two problem that I know of uh, for sure that, in, that you can do experimentally. And I remind you that the equation of motion for a crack is just the energy flowing in to the tip of the crack has to equal the amount of energy or the dissipation uh, that one needs in order to break a, uh, a section of context or a unit length of context. And the cracks that we'll be talking about have this, the speed limit of the Raleigh wave speed. Okay, let's go back to the problem of what happens. I mean, this is a typical measure from one of the strain gauges in the system of, uh, this is the uh, shear component of the, as a, okay, this is the shear as a function of the distance behind the tip of this rupture that we're seeing. And I guess, as you can see very clearly here, the shear beyond, behind the, this crack front is not zero, it's actually quite large. It's much larger than the deviations uh, created by this moving front. So how in the world can we use fracture mechanics to describe such, such an object? Well, what do we do? It's a linear problem. Forget the nonlinear stuff that I told you about yesterday. It's relevant, but not entirely relevant here. But in a linear system, I can take a constant and I can subtract it away and my solutions are still the same. So that's what I do. This is, a, this is due to Palmer and Rice, this idea. So I'll be talking about differences or stress changes here. And when, when I subtract away this residual stress behind the crack front, I'm back to conditions that are exactly analogous to fracture. This is now, this, the back of the crack is now essentially stress-free. So now I can use the mechanics of uh, the tools of fracture mechanics to describe or to try to describe uh, these signals. Okay, let's do that. So, these are the three, three components of the, strain, of the strain measured a few millimeters away from the interface as a function of the distance from the crack tip. So, um, okay. Well, the, I was very enthused when I saw these wiggly lines. I, I, you're quiet here. Too much lunch, huh? Doesn't that tell you anything? No, didn't tell me much either. Okay, so we get a lot of wiggly lines. In fact, we had a lot of phenomenology. We we're playing around. We could get things sometimes to scale and all this stuff. Okay, and then we realized, you know, we think of these things look like cracks. Why don't we just compare it to the solutions of linear elastic fracture mechanics? Now, what happens is that we don't, you don't see anything that looks like a singularity here. Why not? Because the, the measurement point, the strain gauge is moved a, a few millimeters away from the interface. So this is uh, as a function of the distance from the crack tip, but as in X, 
the crack tip never actually goes to to r equals zero it's as as the crack passes the strain gauge it sweeps r it changes it a bit but it generally just sweeps theta from from minus pi to pi okay good well but we have we have analytic solutions for a crack so let's just compare them and our ana analytic solutions are these these are the stress uh these are the uh, stress singularities or the strain singularities. And this is a known analytic function. This is sigma ij. ij stands for the different components of the stress tensor. And it's a CF. I'm going to confuse you a lot because I, I threw slides from various uh, talks. Sometimes I call the crack velocity V. Sometimes, sometimes I call it the front velocity CF. It's the same thing. I apologize ahead of time. I tried to erase and change, but didn't make it for all the slides. Okay. Yeah, anyway, so here's our stress intensity factor. Here's our stress singularity. Question? Hmm? What are the... Ah, no, I didn't tell you. You didn't miss it at all. Um, we actually found, and this is an old plot, okay, found that for low velocities, the once we scale by the distance from the crack tip, they all look the same. Now, each one of the signals is so messy that I just shoved them all together and it looks much smoother that way. But uh, the different colors are just uh, from four ten, four hundredths of the Raleigh wave speed to about 0.3, and you see they look the same. But we'll find out why in a minute. But you're right. It's um, I should I should just show one and be embarrassed. But this way I can show three and or, or a bunch of them and be embarrassed. But in the way you're describing them, um, they, this crack has. In the way you're going to analyze them, you have to know the distance of the crack plane yeah. from the from the strain gauge. Yeah, yeah. But remember, we're following the real contact area, so I know at any instant where the tip of the crack is, and then I can shift things. Uh -huh. You don't need to know that that height ahead of time. No, oh, well, I know this height as well, but uh, that's to, that's in order to see if these compare at any any way to the solutions. But if I want to know where the tip is, I know that to to within about a hundred microns where the tip is in any given microseconds. Thank you. So, no, thanks for the questions. Just. Okay, questions also wake me up because I had lunch as well. So just ask if something is not clear. Um, okay, so we have here our, our fracture mechanics solution. And let's just compare. So the only we only have one free parameter here, which is the stress intensity factor K. So let's twiddle it until we can get this to look like that. Okay, that looks pretty good. But now we're stuck because we've used up all our free parameters, and this is a tensor. So does it really work? Obviously, it works, because otherwise I wouldn't have asked the question. So our one free parameter describes all of the data very well. And in fact, since we're all experts in fracture mechanics, we know that we can convert from the stress intensity factor to the fracture energy through the energy release rate. So K squared is the energy flowing into the crack tip, just to remind you. And so I can calculate how much energy it costs to break a unit area of contacts. And it's about one joule per meter squared here. In a second, we'll take a look at what that number means, but right now it's a number. It's not just a number because actually I can use this number now and look at any fracture or any of these frictional ruptures at any speed uh, along this interface. And this should be this should characterize the ensemble of contacts along the interface. And we're not really screwing up, screwing them around with them. So this thing for a given experiment is going to be the same. And so for any velocity of the crack, this should tell me exactly what these wiggly lines should be. And in, in particular, for fast cracks, these functions, okay, the wiggly lines are much worse, but it still works. And this is with the same value of one joule per meter squared 
that we measured with the, uh, with the slow cracks. So why are these different? Because this function, this angular function here is critically dependent on how fast, the, the closer you get to the Raleigh wave speed, and this is at 0.6 of the Raleigh wave speed, this function actually becomes singular. So it's, it's a nasty function, but we know what it is and it works incredibly well. So frictional, the bottom line is frictional ruptures are really shear cracks. They can be described entirely by fracture mechanics. Um, and with basically no adjustable parameters, only this value here. Okay. Um, what am I saying? Okay. So, in order to close this picture, though, we still have to understand what gamma is. You know, what's this one jowl per square meter? Where's it coming from? Can we, can we get, a, get a handle on it? And um, let's take a look. So now the dissipation in this system comes from the change in the real area of contact at a given point, right? Because we're not... We're not killing all the contacts because they're still holding up the, the back end of, 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 the, of the crack because something somebody has to counter this ton of, of weight that we're pushing down on. And but the delta A is actually the, the, that's the fracture energy. And this is a picture. Well, it kind of looks like far galaxies and stuff, but it's not. This is. These are uh, measurements made by uh, a few years ago by Dietrich and Kilgore. And each one of these white points is a real contact and outer space here means nothing. Okay, so for the conditions of our experiment, the real area of contact is about a half a percent of the nominal one, which is kind of what's shown here. Okay, now, sure. Um, no one has ever done that. No one has ever measured the temperature uh, that I know of for this stuff, uh, the local temperature. Right. Uh, one can backtrack and get it. In other words, I can, uh, okay, one reason you can't, it's difficult to measure directly, nothing's impossible, is because this is an acrylic and it's a wonderful thermal insulator. So if I even took like an IR camera or something and, and shined it or something, I couldn't see through it, it's opaque. So I can't really see the heating up of the contacts. I won't talk about it, but one can take this value of, ga of, of uh, gamma and then uh, say, what, is, what should be the temperature rise at the instant, I know how thick the layer is of, of the interfaces. It's about a micron thick. So I can take this and throw it into the into there, and then you get a large temperature rise of the context. And we had this discussion over lunch a while, a few days ago, but this is happening so fast, I'm not sure that there's a real concept of temperature here because it's such a non-equilibrium -equilibri phenomenon that, um, you can't, you don't populate all of the, all of the degrees of freedom uh, if you have a disturbance moving around the sound speed, but you can, you can see how much heat per unit uh, area you get at the context, but I won't be talking about that here. Yeah, but um, the earlier part of your talk, you could uh, use the camera to find out the area of contact. Yeah. But you could, if you use simultaneously infrared camera, could you possibly look at the correspondence between? I would have to find an infrared camera with sensitivity T, okay. in a band that goes through. Okay, thank you. And I so, got yeah. it. Thank you. Maybe you mentioned this in your early lectures. What is the energy budget for the dissipation you have? So if you go back to Griffith's criterion, it's the energy required to create two fresh surfaces. But in the non-equilibrium, scenario that you are describing today, we would have to think about the thermal release, but also the acoustic release? No, 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 no. The acoustic release, thermal release, that happens also when you, and under mode one fracture. Um, the energy needed is this gamma, but where, does it, where is it coming from? And that's, uh, 
Well, let's take a look. Okay, so first of all, the, the amount of real area contact area drops by 20, 30% or something like that. And we know that we have a half a percent of, uh, of the contact area. So if I took my measurement and then normalized it as if these stars covered the whole interface, I would get a, a bulk fracture energy of about a thousand joules per meter squared. Okay, a thousand joules per meter squared is, is precisely the fracture energy of bulk plexiglass, precisely within a factor of two or so. So actually there's nothing mysterious about this value of gamma. It's just the number, it just reflects the number of contacts and each one is breaking as if the material was a bulk material. So we're good in that sense. And not only that, okay, this is not a material, this value is not a material constant at all. It's proportional to the real area of contact. But the real area of contact is proportional to the pressure that we're applying. So we can check that. So with our optics, we can see that the fracture energy indeed increases linearly with uh, the pressure, the, the, the normal, str normal uh, stress that we're applying. And this is exactly the Bowden and Tabor picture that we, were that we started with. So the contacts behave exactly like they flow until they don't and, and they can support weight. And uh, that's the meaning of the fracture energy. Okay, so just to summarize this piece of the talk. Oh, I didn't. How did I do that? Okay. Anyway, I hope you didn't see anything because it would have spoiled my, my introduction. Um, frictional rupture fronts are essentially shear cracks. And now we can use this fact to quantitatively describe things. For example, the fracture energy, what is the fracture energy? What are the characteristics of this frictional interface? These are very, very far from any characteristics of the bulk material, because we're talking about material that's under pressure that's very close to its yield stress. So, and, and these, these contacts are what's holding this system together. I mean, this is what the, gives frictional resistance. So it's, it's, they're almost entirely invisible, but with this, uh, with fracture mechanics as a microscope, we can actually start to look at them. Use fracture mechanics to, for example, get out under different conditions what the fracture energy is. So we'll do that. So the first thing we're gonna do is do it when we lubricate the interface. So we're gonna put some oil on the interface and take a look. A few surprises are gonna be there. Um, and then as I told you beforehand, we're gonna use fracture mechanics to predict the magnitude of earthquakes in the laboratory. It would work also in nature if we could get the right measurements. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll talk about the equation of motion for earthquakes. It's now the equation of motion for cracks. Does it work? Can we describe the motion of, of, of earthquakes? And that's what we're gonna do now. So first we're gonna, Instead of talking about a dry interface, we're gonna be talking about a slimy interface. So we're gonna take a lubricant, and this is called the boundary lubrication regime. We're just gonna smear lubricant for a, a thin layer that doesn't fill up the gaps. Don't wanna fill up the gaps because I start. don't want to create poor pressure. Yeah. Is it okay to ask before you start the new stuff um, about the dry thing? Ah, okay. Back to dry stuff. do with the and, and i'm still having trouble with uh, the, this issue right so if you release the normal force now these are two surfaces that you can just pick apart right is they're not cold welded together or anything like that right no how come that doesn't reflect in this uh, in this calculation of gamma ah, it's nice okay. correspondence of gamma if you're not breaking bonds not at all, but what, not, then, then it, that's a deep question actually, because where does the fracture energy from bulk PMMA come from in the first place? And okay, part of it is snapping bonds, but if you have a perfect interface, 
your fracture energy is going to be something like one or two joules per meter squared. That's a carbon, you know, take carbon bonds, uh, I don't know, three angstroms apart or something and do the math, which you did in the first day, actually. And you'll get on the order of, of a few joules, one or two joules per meter squared. The fracture energy for PMMA is a thousand joules per meter squared. What's going on? And most of that work is coming from plastic deformation of the material in order to get to the point where we can snap the bonds. And the same thing happens with, with, uh, with contacts. We have uh, the real picture that, we, that I should have drawn is something like that. They don't sit on one another, they shove up against one another. Okay, I can throw a few more just for fun. But there's no reason that they should mate at all. You know, so I'll have, I'm really bad at drawing pictures, but whatever. So let's concentrate just on these two bumps. Now, how in the world is this bump going to pass this? Now, if the inter if, if if this is small relative to this, it's just going to squeeze it and deform it. And that and that costs so it's plastically deforming. And that's what's taking all the energy. So it's still the same energy per unit, uh, per unit area, but that's the cause of this energy. It's not really bond breaking. Thanks for the question. Keep asking, yeah. Uh, from the picture of the interface, um... Uh, when you increase the normal force, the area of contact also linearly increase. Yeah. Okay. So, and uh, yeah, so I was wondering that it is actual contacts are very far apart. So how does it happen? Like, for example, as you increase the normal stress where a, a contact is there, does it grow in size or like the random contacts? appear how the area increases uh first of all i don't know because we've never looked at a magnification that we could see individual contacts we could but then we couldn't see the rest of this stuff i mean have to but i think both are true the contacts that are, are exist as you push harder will grow and then the free surfaces here will deflect and you'll get new contacts as well. Some of them, most of them will be plastic. Some of them might be just barely touching and they'll be elastic. But uh, still empirically, what we, we find, uh, what Bowden and Tabor predicted, which is nice. It's nice to agree with somebody sometime. You know. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. So. Uh... When this uh, contact area increases, so uh, so I'm assuming that uh, so since these two surfaces are very close, so overall attraction between two surfaces should be should also increase if the contact area is increasing. So, but so any comments on that? Um, I didn't I didn't get the question over here. Turn on your Please mic a bit. Or, okay, so the contacts are really close. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so when the so at the point of fielding, when the contact area increases, so the wonderful attraction between the two surfaces will also increase. And uh, so, but as as we know that uh, after the friction, we can take the thing out. I mean, they, these two planes can be separated out. Well, you'll get a little bit of adhesion of Van der Waals adhesion, but that's dwarfed by the other energies, by the plastic deformation energy and such. So when I say that they're free, everything is relative. I would say that I'm free, but look at the government that's uh, developing in Israel. But okay, that's a different question. Um, so yeah, I mean, van der Waals forces certainly exist. In fact, there are other caveats that I haven't told you about because I didn't want to uh, confuse the issues. But uh, for example, our, if the surfaces get too close then we start to get tunneling of light through the surfaces. Okay, so we get evanescent propagation. This is all true, but we we take care of it. So I, I, um, I gave you the cartoon picture of the experiments. It's a bit more involved than that. But, uh, there was another question, yeah. Hello. 
do you, uh, while you compare the, the uh, energy scale which is uh, behind that uh, front propagation and then you compare with the earthquake mechanism but during shear you are eventually breaking the contacts and forming the new contacts so your energy scale is also it's not constant it should fluctuates yeah yeah, yeah. It's, so it should not be constant things should be subtracted out uh, that's why we spent an incredible amount of money to make these plexiglass plates very very flat so statistically we have a continuum now what does that even mean um the the dissipative zone or the uh, the distance between contacts is a few microns. The, the, the contacts themselves are small. So we have, um, so long as, as we're not looking too close to the crack tip, we can take our glasses off and we still see an effective continuum. Yes, we're creating new contacts. We're not creating, we're breaking new contacts all the time. But, um, but you know, actually I'll give you the easy answer. LAF fracture mechanics works. So apparently we're apparently the assumptions are justified. If, on the other hand, we didn't go to the trouble of uh, get, getting rid of the waviness of, of the plates, then we would be talking about maybe jumping from one contact to another contact. Three points could hold up the interface. So um, not really, but you know that's the idea. So here we're talking, we really are talking about a continuum. And when you look at the, at the, at the optical signals coming through, you do see a continuous field. Now you get closer and closer, you start to see discreteness, but then also in a real material, if I break plexiglass, it's full of holes. If I get close enough, you know, I see the mesh and all this stuff. So as long as I can allow myself to take a step back and think of it as a continuum, I'm fine, uh, as long as the, the data actually bear out this assumption. Any other questions? Yeah. Is that kind of related to what you just answered? Is that to what level can we treat these small contacts as continuum? Because that, I, I think that's what you just did. Yeah, yeah. Each pixel in my imaging has about a thousand contacts inside it. The pixels that we have are it's our camera limitation, but it's about 100 microns by, by a millimeter or something. So we do see a, a statistical continuum. And that's what I'm describing as we talk about the, the crack tip. Um, I don't have enough money to buy a 10 gazillion pixel camera that can take pictures at a, mega, at, at a, thousand, a million frames a second. I don't think anyone does actually, but uh, so we do it, we can. if like the the size of the contacts is uh comparable to the size of the individual constituents of your material like you know materials made of like discrete things ah uh, no no we're we're far this, this is a in that sense it's the material is a continuum the mesh size is maybe a nanometer or less of, of the pmma and we're talking about uh, micron size uh, objects. So we're, we're, we're pretty far from the structure of the polymer that's, that's making these things up. Okay, more questions? So I really don't have to finish, you know, we can just declare, declare it done and go party or something. Okay, anyway, um, so let's now lubricate or put a, a slimy layer, thin layer of slime on the interface. And we're gonna use fracture mechanics. First of all, I have to convince you, uh, these are the lubricants that we'll be using since we're a physics lab and the, the lubricant of choice is silicon oil. So we have silicon oil from here to kingdom come. So we'll be looking at uh, silicon oils of viscosities from five to 10 to the fourth uh, centistoke. Uh, also, we had a harbin, hydrocarbon oil hanging around. I think it's vacuum pump oil, but um, we use that too. It's 200 centistokes, so we're going to compare the results, but I still have to show you that we're talking about fracture 
even if we have a slimy interface. So I'll do that. Uh, okay, so this is actually a fully lubricated interface and we still see stick, stick slip behavior there, but the friction coefficient is much, much less. This is what I'll be talking about. This is in boundary lubrication. And these are the stick slip uh, things in dry lubrication. You already see where we're going here, I think. Uh, are we seeing cracks? Well, this is this uh, coated surface. And yeah, we see cracks moving up to here, nearly the Raleigh wave speed of the material. And even in the fully lubricated, this is a hard picture to take, by the way, but that's a different story. Even in the fully lubricated, when, when the contacts are full, we still see cracks, but we're going to be we're going to be looking at uh, these these uh, coated uh, contacts and not not the fully lubricated ones. Because there's another issue when you fill up all the holes with the lubricant, you change the effective pressure. You know the the, the oil filling up is reducing the pressure on the uh, on 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 the uh, asperities on the contacts, and I don't want to get into that, so I'm not going to talk about fully lubricated. Um, and also, I don't have that much to say about them. Okay, but let's compare. So dry interfaces, we have the black uh, lines uh, over the wiggly color lines, and that's fine. This is LAFM. And also for these lubricated interfaces, we have more or less the same thing. So LAFM seems to describe the stress tensors. There's one big difference, though. Look at the numbers. Okay. This is the, the fracture energy of this particular film is 20 times that of the dry film. Now, how the hell did that happen? We started, we had a dry interface and everybody knows if your interface is dry, it increases friction and all that. And we, we put the lubricant on it and we did make it uh, slimier, slipperier. But on the other hand, how the fracture energy increased. What's going on here? And it's not only, okay, so this is, uh, these are data from the dry interface as a function of the normal force that we're, we're applying. And this is the linear behavior that I showed you earlier. So this is the fracture energy as a function of, uh, of the pressure. And um, this is for five centistokes silicon oil. So we see the same linear behavior. This is for 100 centistokes silicon oil. And this one is for 10,000 centistokes silicon oil. And first thing I guess you can see is the viscosity doesn't seem to matter that much. It's not the um, shear of the lubricant layer isn't playing a role here. We're breaking something, but we're not shearing anything. And that's what's coming to the fracture energy. And if I change to this vacuum pump oil here, um, actually it gets, we get to about 50 times more or something. Um, each time the linear, it, uh, it's linear with, with, the, uh, with the pressure, but with the normal pressure, but uh, okay. So we find that it's always linear. Viscosity doesn't affect the uh, fracture energy, which is kind of a surprise until you think about it. And then different lubricants, the chemistry matters. That's what it's telling us. Different lubricants have different fracture energy. Um, the difference, by the way, between uh, silicon oils and hydrocarbons, even if you have longer, higher viscosity, it's just the length of the chains, the entanglement of the chains. So, Five centistoke and 10,000 centistoke silicon oil have the same, they're made of the same stuff. These are just shorter chains and these are very, very, very much longer chains. So the, there's no slip going on there where the, where the friction, where the viscosity plays a role. It's happening too fast. Okay. I think it's within the error bars, kind of. Yeah, I, uh, this is as good as it gets. So it doesn't, uh, yeah, maybe if you really, but you know, look at these guys. <laughs> so certainly not increases like we've increased uh, the viscosity. Okay. Um, 
So we have a weaker interface because we've reduced the friction coefficient. But we have a stronger interface because we've increased the dissipation or the fracture energy. Uh, what's going on here? And I don't know if I'm going to finish this talk, but we'll get to wherever we get to. Um, the trick is looking at the structure of the dissipative zone here. So this is our fracture mechanics singularity. Now remember, as we approach the singularity, then we get into a dissipative region, which cuts off the singularity. Now we'll use a toy model for this, which is as good as, the, as, as any other toy model for, for these things. And this is uh, to model the dissipative zone. And that's just that, okay, within this dissipative zone, you have some maximal stress that the material can uh, countenance, okay? And the fracture energy is just the slip that takes place until from the, uh, from the time that you go from uh, the maximal stress to the residual stress of the material. Okay, so the, this is the sliding stress of the material. And during that time, each asperity moved a scale, which is in a micron scale of something which we'll call DC. And, uh, and so the fracture energy is just um, basically one half, it's basically the area of this triangle. So that's the, that's the amount of being dissipated. And now, um, what happens with uh, in, in a dry interface? So we find, uh, we can estimate the peak stress by various ways, and we measure the residual stress here. And this is what, this is our triangle. And uh, this is what happens with silicon oil. So actually the peak stress goes up a little bit, but the residual stress goes way down. So the area of this triangle becomes larger. And with the hydrocarbons, this peak even goes twice as much as that. So, and, and the region of slip that takes place at each point until we actually get to, a, um, get to the residual stress is much larger. And this we can also measure. So the reason, so this is dissipation. It has actually nothing to do with the frictional resistance. This is how much energy we're, we're applying to break these oily uh, contacts. Now, if we have a lubricant in there, how can this be higher than that? How can the, the, the lubricated contact be, have twice as high a peak strength as the dry one? Well, um, this now goes into the realm of science fiction, but I think that. Um, this is my picture of what's happening. We have a layer, a very thin layer of lubricant between uh, the contacts here. This is actually the cartoon that I tried to draw on the board. And remember the pressures here are huge. So what we're doing with these huge pressures is we're, we're making this lubricant into a pseudo solid. It, we're giving it shear strength. Now there are various mechanisms that people know about that can do that. So you have a layering transition uh, for very thin layers. It's been known for um, two decades or something like that, where even water, if you press it down to the nanometer level, all of a sudden you find that it starts to crystallize if you have very, very clean surfaces. Um, not only water, anything, many liquids. Uh, and you can have various, there are various models giving elasticity to these layers, but basically we're, we're filling in the little nano voids here. So we're increasing the, the, the contact area actually, and giving, uh, giving higher strength to this contact. And so the residual strength is lower because once these get past each other, then the lubricant actually starts to lubricate. It reduces uh, the friction. So all in all, um, the, the overall fracture energy, the overall dissipation of such a, such a uh, such a joint becomes much higher. And this is no, there's no way we could have measured this without using fracture mechanics as kind of a microscope. Okay, let's now switch uh, switch gears 
and we'll go into the earthquake prediction business. Okay, again, we're going to use what we know about fracture mechanics. Okay, this is a zoom in of a typical uh, shear strength curve as a function of time. And these are the stick slip events here. And these look like noise. But remember, yesterday I said that there's no noise in my data. We have perfect data. So in my group, not me, they, don't, they won't let me touch the experiment, but my students are very good. So these things actually have significance. And what significance do they have? Well, right over here, that's the first stick slip. I labeled these backwards or something. So this is the first stick slip event in which a, uh, an earthquake went over the whole in interface. But over here, we had an earthquake that moved and then like arrested in the middle. And over here, it went a little bit further and further and further until we got to the point where the whole thing moved. You don't see much here, only little blips, because the only thing that moved is one edge over here, but over here, nothing moved. So the whole, there wasn't any macroscopic uh, uh, motion in the system. And actually, these are real earthquakes in the following sense. You never see an earthquake that barrels through an entire fault. It always stops someplace. Even in the, the magnitude nine earthquakes, there's still a lot more fault that could have been broken. So earthquakes are always arrested friction events like these. Now, can we use what we measure and what we know about fracture to predict where this is going to stop and where this guy is going to stop from, uh, from the stresses that we measure? Okay, so let's take a look. Um, first of all, I remind you that both the normal and uh, shear stresses along this interface are very non-uniform, even though we're applying probably as uniform as we can make uh, uh, conditions or, or, or forces or stresses at the, at the, at the boundaries of the system. Um, now, the definition of crack arrest, G, remember, is our energy flux to the tip of the crack. A crack will stop moving once the energy flowing into the tip becomes lower than our friend, the fracture energy. That's what's called the Griffith criterion for fracture aficionados. Okay, now this G is, a, uh, is this, the stress intensity factor squared, more or less. Uh, and the stress intensity factor, I just remind you, is this coefficient of the, sing of the singularity of the, of, the, of the stress and strain fields. Okay, now we're going to use that. We're going to use something I didn't tell you about fracture mechanics, but okay. This we measure, as I just showed you. And this we can actually calculate from the stress profiles that we measure. And I'll go through that kind of quickly. So fracture mechanics in general, at, at, at any given velocity, this is what the stress fields look like. Um, so they're singular, they have a theta dependence, and they're, they're dependent on the velocity. And when the velocity becomes zero, we also have what I'll call the static stress intensity factor because nothing is moving. But we also have a stress singularity, the same one. And that we can uh, and that we can calculate. And how do we do that? We'd use this weighted integral, but basically what this is saying is these are, I'm calculating if I have a vert, this is where my crack is, but if I have a virtual crack at length L here, um, if I measure the stresses that I'm getting right now along the interface, that's what this delta tau of X is, Using this weighted integral, it will tell me what the static stress intensity factor is at this length. Where is this magic coming from? It's basically coming from the fact that, um, suppose I did have a crack out to here. It's easier to think about than a tensile crack. Well, I could fix that by taking the stresses along the boundary and squashing them down until my parabolic interface becomes flat. Okay, and then I've, that's the, that's the stress distribution 
that I'm getting. So I can, so this is a kind of the backwards problem, if you like. So using this integral, this is our square root singularity and all that, I can calculate this. And I measure these stresses along the interface. That's the only place I measure the, inter, the, the stresses. So doing that, uh, let's see. So, um, okay, this is making a very long story very short. These are the predicted values of the arrested cracks here. And this axis are the measured values by how, when, and this is a straight line of slope one. In other words, it works perfectly. Now, all the different colors are different um, stresses that we've applied a uh, factor of eight or so. Uh, by, so that changes the fracture energy and all that, but it doesn't really matter. Um, each one of these is for a different distribution of stresses along the interface, but we're taking that into account with this funny weighted integral because this doesn't have to be constant. It's, it's, it's a function of X. So we, if we measure it, we can use that. And, you know, we can predict perfectly what the magnitude is of an earthquake in the laboratory. Now, had, if we could measure the stresses along a natural fault, we could also estimate uh, how large an earthquake is going to be with a certain caveat, both here and there. We estimate how large an earthquake is going to be if it nucleates here and now. So I have this distribution of stresses and then God comes and kicks the fault or whatever and causes an earthquake. I haven't gone into what caused what that kick was, but if it starts, I can, I'll tell you when it's going to finish. Moreover, I can also tell you how it's going to move. So this is a, a quick example I'll give you of, um, of testing the equation of motion for frictional ruptures, for frictional fractures. Call them fractures, ruptures, and cracks, earthquakes, it's all the same. Okay, this is energy balance again. So the energy flowing into the tip of the crack is equal to the energy cost, this gamma. Now, for large systems, uh, this actually, there's a miracle of nature that this breaks down into this uh, static stress intensity factor, whatever, that we just calculated with the stresses. This is, this is, what, this is where we got our criterion for crack arrest. Times some universal function, uh, this we measure, of course. Okay, this is the static thing that we just talked about where we measured the K static and K squared over the Young's modulus is equal to this thing. And it's a function of the length of the virtual length of the crack. And this is a universal function, uh, conveniently written in yellow so you can't read it, but this is a textbook function that's calculated. So it's, it's a known universal function and it's only a function of the instantaneous velocity of the crack. Okay, these are 10 or so experiments. What are the conditions here? I played God. Again, from Jerusalem, we're allowed to do that. Unfortunately, every person that lives in Jerusalem believes the same thing. And that's why our country currently looks like it does, but we're not gonna go there. That's a much more difficult problem than this. Okay, but we took the same two slabs of stuff and we did 10 uh, experiments. Each one we loaded with the same normal force. And we then cranked up the shear force for each one. Um, and for example, when I got, when we got, it wasn't me, it was my student, Elias Vetlitsky, but I use the royal we here. When we got to like this stress, then we perturbed uh, the, the back of the system, hit it with a hammer or something, I don't know. And then we watched what happened. So when you perturb the system at this level, then you get an earthquake. And Sometimes, you know, we, we, we did the same experiment, just cranked it up to much higher shear stress and then triggered the earthquake by hand. 
I think it was literally by hand. What we did was this at the at the tail of the uh, of the sample. Okay, what does this tell you? Okay, the first thing it tells you is something surprising. There is no static friction coefficient that's characteristic of anything because all of these gave rise to sliding. The stress, the normal stress was the same. The shear stress here varies by nearly an order of magnitude. And each one of these could be unstable, it could slide. So there's no characteristic value of of uh, of this delta tau or tau or something that would cause this any anything to happen um i'll show you more data on that in a second but what is the effect of the different stresses well you can guess you get okay for the lowest stresses you get slower cracks I and mean, this is the velocity of the crack color coded as a function of the of the length so you know, the high, high stress, it just immediately jumped nearly to the Raleigh wave speed and stayed there. And the slow guys, okay, this one actually started a higher stress and the stress went, went the low. So this started faster and then just slowed down, but didn't stop. Okay, good. So we have a lot of stresses. We have a lot of uh, motion. But remember, we have our equation of motion and our equation of motion should be able to predict each one of these things using again energy balance, the energy flowing into the crack tip equals the dissipation. And all of these collapse to the single universal function or one over the, or the inverse of the universal function that I showed here. So fracture mechanics not only predicts when things will stop, but when they're moving, it does a phenomenal job of predicting their dynamics whether it's going to be a slow or really fast crack, they all sit on the same curve. And that's just, uh, okay, now I have five more minutes. Um, let me just show you the problem that we still have and we're dealing with as we speak. So, uh, uh, okay, the friction coefficient, just for fun. These are different experiments with the same plates. This is the spread of, of, of uh, static friction coefficients that we measure. The only thing we did to, under the same conditions, you get exactly the same static friction coefficient, but it's different from this guy. We tilted the plates by a hundredth of a degree. Now we can do that because we see how far the plates are from one another. So, and just by, and, and no one else could do this experiment. You just you know, for all intents and purposes, we just shoved the two plates together and did a friction experiment. But you can see that here, there's at least a factor of two difference. Uh, this is not only our thing. This, this is something from, I think, the 60s or the 70s. There was a, this was perceived as a problem in engineering circles. Something was wrong with the idea of a static friction coefficient. So, Someone sent the same two samples or the same specifications of samples or something to various friction labs across the world. And so this is the friction coefficient of these standardized samples as a function of the country. Now, this is an old, uh, it's an old thing. So this, I think, is West Germany at the time, the Federal Republic of, I think that's Germany, Great Britain, France. You might notice, first of all, you should notice that there's a huge variation of the of this of the static friction coefficient so we're not the only one that's that sees these in our lab uh, but there are some nuances you know like the germans it's actually pretty well you know they, they, there's less of a spread the italians on the other hand there's quite a large spread uh, but that's another story um, but the friction coefficient is still it's kind of a fiction coefficient if you like okay last thing remember we need a crack for fracture mechanics. So the last story that I wanted to tell, and I won't get to it, is uh, how that happens. And that's the question of nucleation, because what determines the static friction coefficient is not the stresses that we apply, because the system is, is metastable. It's going to be stable until something happens. But what is that something that makes the initial tear um, Here's a movie that I found in the archives. 
So as I, I was tired, so I, I decided to use the Hollywood. So, okay, what makes the initial crack? And um, that one, well, maybe the next time I come, I'll tell you about it. I didn't think I would get to it anyway. But uh, the bottom line is that uh, it's something that's actually not fracture mechanics at all. It's deterministic, but it's not fracture mechanics, not standard fracture mechanics. Right now, I'm in the midst of working, writing a paper with friends, some friends of mine that actually ex extend fracture mechanics to include the nucleation. But uh, since I haven't told you what nucleation is, I won't tell you about the theory that explains it. Um, but with that, let me just jump to my conclusions. Ah, wait, one, one neat thing just for fun. In order to create nucleation controllably, we had to, we arrested a crack here and then let it renucleate and then just looked, you know, put all of our guns on this part where the nucleation arrived. But the neat thing is, how did we control the crack? How did we stop the crack? We put it in a fracture energy barrier. How did we do that? Uh, oh, wait, it's not here. Oh, God. Up, up, up. Wait, uh, 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 uh. Oh, there it is, a magic marker. Take, thank you. We take a transparency pen, <laughs> just draw a line. And that's enough to increase the fracture energy by a factor of five. Remember our lubricant and all that stuff. Then we have an earthquake booming, zooming along at as fast as it can go. It hits the magic marker and then, so that's how, we, that's how we, that's what we use to look at nucleation. And now I'll just jump to my conclusions and take any questions that you might have. Okay, the thanks part is okay. Here we go. Bup, bup. It went all the way around. Neat. Okay. Wonder if it works backwards. No. Okay. Let me conclude. Uh, think about questions in the meantime, and I'll I'll click on my concluding uh, slide. Okay. Let me go to the take-home messages. Okay. This is what I want you to take home after all of this long monotribe. Okay, we have a new paradigm for friction. It's not a balance of forces, it's actually fracture driven, and fracture driven is an energy balance, not a force balance. We can use fracture mechanics to, to describe earthquakes and anything else, even, even in a greasy, slimy interface that works. And this is what I didn't talk about, the problem of nucleation which is actually rather important. Okay, thank you. No, you should add one more uh, take home message. Hmm. The pen is not just mightier than the sword, it's mightier than the earthquake as well. Yes, this is how we're really going to save Los Angeles, just invest in a lot of magic markers. I think that'll do it. Do we really want to save Los Angeles? Folks. Another question. Uh, in the lubricated surface, you saw that the energy actually increases uh, the fracture energies. And uh, uh, is there any possibility of any attractive kind of uh, interaction is created due to the presence of fluids? Because uh, that also increases different kind of fluid you changes that also varies. That's possible. I don't know if it's an attraction per se, but uh, it's possible that what we're doing with the lubricant is uh, softening that submicron layer, um, allowing more entropy to the uh, to the uh, polymers. So maybe they're creating a, a temporary bond or something. I don't, you know, what the cartoon I showed is what I think, but I don't necessarily think correct things. So it it could well be some. Uh, some polymer softening and not crystallization of the lubricant, but I just don't know. Regarding the, whatever the fracture mechanism you told about, there is an initial uh, crack, small crack that propagates. Now, as you know, if in a system, there are multiple such kind of things. 
now how the system choose which one to propagate um that's an easy one the weakest guy gets uh, well okay no it's uh, it's the weakest point that's relatively high stress but you can get a uh, nucleation at more than one point at the same time but it's just rare you know it's a, it's a it's a two body event you won't see it often because these things travel so quickly so the first guy usually wins unless it's really really slow and then somebody else down the way decides to go at the same time Yeah, then the markers involved there's always magic involved yeah i have a quick question what is it about the chemistry of the lubricants you are using that change the stresses so oh i have no idea i don't know any chemistry at all i never claim to something in the chemistry is important maybe as we said just maybe the softening of the polymer silicon oil softens it less than hydrocarbon hydrocarbon is a solvent um but it could be when squeezed at ungodly forces or pressures uh, the, the, the different chemistry either bonds or doesn't you know? i said that fracture mechanics provides a window to this hidden layer i didn't say it provides answers the answers have to come from a different source um i okay uh, the question again so uh, in an earthquake, we have aftershocks where it's my understanding that the tectonic plates are basically settling back down after the initial motion. Uh, yeah, uh, not really. Not really, is it? Okay. Well, nobody knows. About it. Okay, I, I wanted to know if you can show something like that in laboratory experiments. Yes, the paper is now being reviewed from some journal that I'm not allowed to mention its name. Um, but what we find is that we have invisible earthquakes after the first one all the time. Why are they invisible? Because we've already broken the contact. So any perturbation then sends another earthquake along the interface for nearly free. Because the contacts, it takes them time to reform and to heal. And the slip that takes the macroscopic slip actually is carried by all of these aftershocks it's not just the first one the first one is only maybe 10 or 15 microns the slip could be 100 or 200 microns so it's all of these nearly invisible earthquakes that are doing the work and i have a feeling that they only see a small part or hear a small part of the aftershocks that really take place in a natural earthquake as well so good question and i even have a reasonable answer well Apropos the referees, we'll see if they we'll see if the referees kill it. But then, uh, um, you had a uh, uh, there was one in which you saw a pretty big effect, right? The hydrocarbon oil. Yeah. All of these look pretty good straight lines, but that one didn't go to zero at sigma y y going to zero. Uh, a pretty large gamma. Well, we remember the graph started at two and not at zero. So I'm not sure that it didn't go to zero. Yeah, it looked like it was an intercept, but that was like the minimum pressure that we, yeah. So all of them go like. Yeah, I was thinking of that when I would be when I was showing the graph. I said, "What? Ah, okay, that's that's why I noticed it." Yeah. Well, you know, I wouldn't be very surprised if there was some curvature. Just saying that some interesting chemistry, physics, whatever is happening at these contexts. It's a yeah question about the lubricants like i wonder if you guys have tried with water because i know that in machining that people actually use soap water when yeah. they're machining acrylic yeah yeah they use soapy water actually to cool the 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 bits or something like that but uh, yeah we tried with water it's a factor of two i didn't show it because it wasn't as sexy as a factor of 30 or 50 or something but uh it does work also with the 
with inorganic um, uh, fluids. I actually expected it would be larger effect than water. I was surprised because of the large uh, hydrogen bonds and all this stuff, but I don't know any chemistry, so I'm okay. Uh, so I was wondering that uh, uh, for this earthquake or material failure, like uh, have you looked at the acoustic emission and the distribution of uh, events in this case? Uh, same event I gave two minutes ago. Same answer. We're actually doing it now oh. because um, all of this stuff, it's an easy sell to physicists. We'll buy anything. Actually, engineers kind of like this stuff too. Seismologists, if it's not rock, they don't believe it. You know, oh yeah, but it's not granite or something. Okay. So right now we're doing experiments of these arrested uh, earthquakes or something. And we put a bunch of acoustic sensors, call them seismic probes, if you like. And we want to, because seismic signals, they love. So if we can give them seismic signals, um, they'll be happy. My goal is that I have a suspicion that the way they analyze, what they're assuming when they analyze seismic signals is actually wrong. Because they're coming out with, uh, we can measure the fracture energy, but they come out with values of the fracture energy that go over orders of magnitude from seismic analysis. So I think there's something uh, something funny going on. And that's why, besides the fact that uh, they like seismic signals, so I'm giving them seismic signals. Yeah. So, and why it is wrong? Uh, typical? Well, uh, it's technical, but uh, the the way that they estimate dissipation in, a, in seismic signals is, they look for frequency where it drops off, kind of like uh, uh, tur like in turbulence, basically the the viscous scale or something, and a re similar reasoning or something. And that is not like a sharp cutoff anyway, even on a log plot. And I think that other I, I'm not sure that that's that that might give you the dissipation. Ah, I didn't mention this. But the fracture energy is just a small amount of the total dissipation. Most of it is in frictional heating. Remember, I subtracted away the residual stresses. Okay, but the residual stresses are large. So I still have to move the back of the material. So I think that's what they're doing and they're interpreting it as fracture energy. But I think that the, the uh, different people mean different things when they use the same words. Other questions, comments? If not, let's thank Jay once again yeah. for lovely lecture. And coffee time.